Good afternoon, everybody. Can I welcome you to the second, I think, Grey's In webinar, where we're going to look at the impact of COVID-19 on family trials and how they are being addressed. Uh, we are very fortunate to be joined by two experts in this field, even though it's only been a field that has been available for a relatively short period of time. Uh, Sir Mark Headley, a former uh, family division judge, and Mrs Justice Leaven, uh, who is a recent appointment to the family division. Uh, the format, uh, um, so that you know what to expect, will be a short introduction by me, uh, followed by each of the speakers. Uh, they'll speak for about just up to five minutes, uh, setting out their experience. Uh, and we hope that that will set the scene for uh, an interesting and stimulating discussion. Uh, I've got no details of all the attendees, although I am told that there are a number of members of the bar, a, a number of students, as well as obviously masters uh, of the inn. So I hope that there is a, a broad church of people who will bring uh, their particular views to, uh, to this discussion. Uh, you are invited and encouraged to ask uh, questions throughout the discussion. And to do that, can you use the Q&A option at the bottom of the screen uh, to type in questions as we go, and we'll try and feed those in to uh, a discussion and a question at an appropriate point. If anybody wants to ask a question verbally to the panel, can you please use the raise your hand option? Uh, and then Tony Charles, the Director of Education, who is also with us, although hidden by the Griffin screen, by the Griffin uh, logo, uh, and he will unmute your microphone, uh, and again, so you can uh, ask your question. We are scheduled to last until six o'clock. I have got a clock uh, over my shoulder, so everyone will be able to keep an eye on uh, how we're getting on. Uh, and I hope what we'll, you will see will ge generate a, a discussion about what has happened in the last uh, few weeks. Uh, just a little bit of information about the three of us. Um, I practiced at the family bar uh, from Chambers in Gray's Inn for over 25 years. I was appointed to the family division in 2010 and undertake all types of family work, children, money cases, court of protection, international child abduction and anything else that seems to walk through the door. Um, Mark Headley uh, practised at the bar in Liverpool uh, and on circuit and I think we'll say that he had a common law, old-fashioned common law practice. He was appointed as a circuit judge and then the family division benefited enormously from his appointment to the division in 2002 and he retired in 2013 but as you will hear is still hearing cases in retirement and most recently started a three-week trial on the 16th of March, which was the day of the first announcement from the government in relation to coronavirus. Uh, and by the second week of the trial, uh, he had turned that hearing into a remote uh, hearing. Uh, Natalie Leven is uh, one of our recent additions to the Family Division. She was appointed in January 2019 Prior to that, she had an extremely successful planning and public law practice uh, based at Blackstone Chambers. Uh, she, I don't think, did any family case at all in her practice. And so following her appointment, she brought extremely important external eyes to the family division. Uh, and in probably every meeting she has, we have with Natalie, she always says, you know, why do you do that? What's the point of that? Which is extremely helpful and invigorating in relation to any discussions and the way that we operate uh, what we do. Just quickly to set the scene, um, it is only 10 weeks ago uh, that coronavirus was something that we were all reading about in the newspapers as something that was happening in other countries uh, and there was some suggestion it, it may come here. But by the second government announcement on the 23rd of March, uh, all family hearings since then have taken place remotely. Uh, in the early weeks, uh, many cases were adjourned and they were adjourned until June or July. 
in the expectation that everyone thought then is that we would be back to normal by then. They would be attended in-person hearings uh, that we had all uh, practiced in for many years. What has become clear in the last uh, few weeks is that this situation is not going to change for a significant period of time. It is very likely that uh, hearings that require social distancing will be continuing until the end of the year or probably into the spring of next year, with the result that being able to manage some of the work, a significant proportion is going to need to be dealt with either remotely or what has been termed hybrid hearings with part of the case being in court and the rest of it being uh, remote uh, into the court through uh, various platforms, uh, either Skype or Zoom or whatever. Uh, what is important also is that the decisions that were made that certain cases were not suitable for remote hearings in March and April may have to be re-evaluated now as to whether in the light of that context where we are in this situation for a much longer period of time, whether it is right that in fact certain cases that were thought previously not to be suitable for remote hearing may now, when undertaking the very difficult balance that the judge has to undertake, uh, should be dealt with remotely. The family justice system operates within a statutory framework and there are many statutory provisions that uh, include an important consideration in relation to the balance the court has to undertake. For example, in public law cases, there is a 26 week uh, time limit in which cases are expected to be concluded. Uh, and also section one of the Children Act it sets out specifically that any delay in decision making is inimicable to the welfare of the child. So each family judge now up and down the country is having to undertake that re-evaluation in relation to each case to determine the way in which it should be heard, whether it should be an attended hearing with more courts opening up or whether in fact it can be heard remotely or by way of a hybrid hearing. So with those very brief introductions. I'll turn to uh, Mark first. We're going to be on first name terms, so Lucy and Mark, and then we'll go to Natalie, and then I'll open it up for some discussion. But I'll be keeping an eye on the questions box, and we'll look forward to some questions appearing in there. So, Mark. Thank you very much. And um, I, I, I can, I've got a direct view of Lucy's clock, so I know how long I'm allowed to be as well. Um, if I'm a complete um, technophobe who still announces their presence in court with a red notebook and a fountain pen and therefore was in one sense the last person in the world who should have been coming an expert in this particular area. But it was a case of needs must because I was asked to do the third retrial of a very difficult case involving a dead and injured child. Um, and we launched on the 16th of March with um, six or seven parties in the hearing. And it became rapidly apparent during the course of that first week that we couldn't go on. And the parties, I think, took the initiative to suggest that this should continue as a Zoom hearing. And we were able to have a, uh, the last day of that week, as it were, to have a dry run to see if it worked. It seemed to, and then we successfully completed another nine days of evidence and one, a day of argument um, by using Zoom. And I can say a little bit about it now because I've given judgment and the order implementing the judgment has been drawn up. So, uh, and will be in Bailey in due course. Um, I think the two key lessons that I think I learned from doing it was first, you cannot do this unless everybody is willing for it to happen. I think with six parties in some 25 different locations, because there were senior and junior counsel experts and all the rest of it, uh, as well as the family, uh, it required the cooperation of everybody to make sure that it worked. It also required learning a sort of new forensic disciplines in the sense that Zoom is very, very noise sensitive and everyone was working from home and noises off at home if you weren't self-muted meant that you were suddenly catapulted in front of the witness who was on the screen causing a certain amount of havoc in terms of gathering the evidence. 
So it required both cooperation and quite strong and relatively new forensic disciplines um, if it was to work. Um, I and I one or two of the counsel in the case had been involved in the long case in Manchester the year before where because there were 120 people in court all the evidence had to be taken remotely because nobody could give evidence in that setting um, and um, so we had some working feel of what it was like doing things by using uh, these kind of connections but uh, that was all in the court building whereas this of course nobody was anywhere near a court building until I sat in a court building to give judgment um, so I think those were the, the sort of two key lessons that learned. I think the parties who kindly put in a document expressing their um, uh, understanding of, of, of it all and which will be annexed to the judgment, so it'll be there for everyone to see in due course. Uh, I think they found it helpful, but it was, because it was a third trial, there were a number of things that didn't matter quite as much as they usually do because how parties reacted to the evidence and that sort of thing. Well, they'd heard it twice before. They'd given evidence twice before. Um, so that in a sense, it was a, a slightly different trial uh, and therefore made, I think, doing it by Zoom rather easier than it might have been. So that was our impression and, and the sort of key things that came out of it. I shall stop now and uh, will cheerfully join in any question and answers in due course uh, if, if that would be helpful. Thank you, Mark. Natalie. So I have spent um, every working day of whatever it is, the last nine weeks, doing remote hearings. And I've had a real combination contrast in hearings. I've just completed a three-week fact-finding case about a, again, Bit like Mark, dead a child, but with many, many injuries. Um, I've had quite a few two-day, three-day hearings with live witnesses. I've had court protection cases, and I've um, had the joy of applications days in the family division, which are hard enough when you're in person, but become um, Monty Python-esque at times uh, remotely. Um, like Mark, I am a technophobe. Um, I sat through a seminar in January about doing electronic hearings and thought it was all rubbish and it was impossible and it would never happen. And I think my biggest, the biggest lesson for me and that I would pass on to other people is that it can work. It can work far better than I'd certainly ever thought it could. Um, but it only works if the technology works. And it only works if everybody tries hard to make it work uh, and that includes just being very patient when it inevitably it collapses or something goes wrong um the technology it, it is and i find doing this kind of thing really difficult because i can't see any of you and i don't know who you are and i don't know what experience you've got but for those of you who are either in practice or close to practice um it is really important in any hearing that somebody is in control of the technology in my three-week hearing, one of the QCs liked it, set it up, was the host, it worked marvellously. In others, it's been HMCTS staff, but there's got to be somebody who's got a grip and can deal, do the troubleshooting when it happens. Um, the next thing that I've really learned is that it can work um, forensically really surprisingly well. I know a lot of judges have been really worried about will, will they be able to tell the witness is lying? Uh, if you're doing it remotely, can you have the seriousness of the feeling of, of being in court? Um, if it's the right case, and I hope that my three week case, which I was by no means keen to go ahead with at first, but was persuaded by, the, by all the parties, might be the right case. But if you have the right case, I think that you can tell as well as you can in court whether a witness is concentrating whether they are at least making an effort to tell you the truth um i think it is surprise to me and this is i think partly because i'm a newcomer to being a judge and i find the whole idea of being a judge and sitting up on high odd anyway i actually found doing it through a computer worked remarkably well in terms of watching the parties and so on but there are huge problems in cases that have to be done remotely but 
aren't really the right case. So the obvious examples, litigants in person, are very, very difficult to manage remotely if they haven't, unless they're very good at the technology. If they're well behaved and good at the technology, fine, but many struggle. Um, obviously, people with um, English as a, uh, not as their first language or, re or no English can be difficult. Um, one is very reliant on the quality of the interpreter. And obviously in cases where um, either the parties are really distressed, often in court of protection cases, um, or indeed in, in public law family, trying to deal with very unhappy people um, who are then having the additional stress of dodgy Wi-Fi and all of that is, is really hard and takes, in my view, you need massive patience, massive good humour, and just a, a kind of calmness from everybody, not just the judge, but general calmness. Um, one thing I just wanted to touch on, because I know quite a lot of you are students, is that um, I've also done cases in the administrative court remotely. And um, remote hearings are much more intense. Everybody's staring at each other. Everybody can see every movement. Um, if you take two minutes to find your reference, the judge has completely lost her concentration, is looking out of the window wondering what she's going to have lunch, even more obviously than if you're in court. So you need to be even better prepared, even more forensically on it remotely, bizarrely, than I think you do in court. And I didn't really expect that, but there's an intensity of staring into a computer that is actually greater than the intensity in court. Um, so that's just something to think about for those of you who actually might have to do one of these things. And I mean, finally, picking up what Lucy said, when we started eight or ten weeks ago, I think we all thought we could cherry pick the, 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 case, the easy win cases to do remotely, but we are now facing the fact we may have to do all the cases remotely for the next few months, and some of them can't be put off. And I think one positive message is it's not easy, but in some ways it's better than some things that we had before. So, I mean, the, tech, the technology is better than HMCTS's video technology and the RCJ. Um, people turn up on time, which they never do in the RCJ. Um, <laughs> it's much more difficult for witnesses just to wander off. Um, and the tech is much better than trying to do phone hearings, which we used to do a lot as urgent hearings and which really, I, I think, worked incredibly badly. So there are, I mean, I don't want to push it too far, but there are some pluses as well as um, many challenges. All right. Well, um, I'm pleased to say that um, lots of questions have been generated by um, what you both have just said. One of the questions um, relates to um, remote hearings and how you deal with vulnerable clients or witnesses and whether that is an appropriate way for dealing with those sorts of cases and what steps you can take to make sure that their position is protected? Well, I mean, it's the art of the possible. Uh, if I go first on COP and then I'll hand, uh, in my long trial, nobody was vulnerable in any technical sense. But one thing that you can, that Zoom does, and I, I think the other platforms may as well, is, is you can have these breakout rooms so that the, the lay client can talk to their barrister and solicitors out of the sight or sound of the judge. And I think that's a very important thing for vulnerable witnesses. But in COP cases, I mean, I, I have a lot of ongoing COP cases where if I was in London in the RCJ, I'd be meeting a P, I'd be talking to him or her, and that's much, much more difficult to do remotely. Um, but having said which, urgent cops we've been doing over the phone for years, and I mean that is beyond a nightmare in my view. Mm. Mark, is there anything yeah, that you I, I've, it was interesting. My, in in my case, <clears throat> the the parents didn't have English as a first language. That was their only uh, element of vulnerability. But both of them commented to their barristers that they actually found Zoom less intimidating than being in court. And therefore, I, I think I would be relatively relaxed about represented vulnerable clients uh, doing, uh, doing a case by Zoom. It may mean uh, a greater degree of patience and it may mean 
a greater sensitivity to their concentration spans because I agree uh, that with Natalie that that actually it is more intense doing it this way um, you do you're more glued to what is going on and particularly as a judge you can lose a sense of time and lose a sense of how long someone's been giving evidence so uh, you, you may need to be rather more alert to that but other than that um, even if a person has uh, an intermediary it, it seems to me that it is possible uh, to to make these things work though of course you would have to arrange either well for uh, the, the breakout room between intermediary and client as well as counsel and client um, but I think it can be done I, I wouldn't be put off just by that fact and one issue that's that's um, been debated uphill and down down the last few weeks is guidance and the guidance that has been issued so far and whether it would be helpful or not for the president to issue further guidance now we're in the context of a longer time scale than was originally anticipated do either of you have any views about that uh, i'm probably sufficiently deeply involved um to need views about that. I mean, I know there is there is a line of thought which says judges really have to decide all these things on a case-by-case -case basis. But my guess is if you've got a lot of cases and um, a, a number of judges doing it, then guidance does provide um, a, a degree of uniformity uh, and consistency which, which might be desirable. I think the important thing about guidance is that that's what it is. It, it isn't 35 pages of indigestible material um, because that, that then, then that doesn't work very well. Mm. I, I think, I mean, there's a, there's a very good, I thought it's very good, recent Court of Appeal judgment, I think it's RE-A, and mm. it sets out about 12 or 13 different things to think about as to whether you're going to go ahead with a remote hearing and if you are going to go ahead, how you should go ahead. And when I made the decision to go ahead with my three week hearing, I issued a judgment and I based it entirely on REA. And to me, that's the guidance that's needed. It's short, it's the point, it gives you lots of flexibility, but it tells you the things to think about. Mm. Um, I think in terms of the kind of guidance on, you know, how you do a remote hearing. The, the, the reality is there are so many different models. You know, it'd be lovely if in four weeks time, there's one fantastically good platform we all know and understand and we have one, all our clerks and judicial staff and everybody knows what they're doing with it. But we're not in that world at the moment. And I think lots and lots of guidance about how to do the remote hearing is actually just probably confusing people and making them exhausted reading it. Um, mm. But it is, it's important. There's a, a case before the Court of Appeal, I think possibly even today, uh, I think it's this week, which is an appeal that some of the participants may have seen the report of, of Mr Justice Williams, who's part way through a case at the moment and has got to the stage where he's heard the expert evidence and is moving on to the lay evidence and for various different reasons that is going to take place in court with the mother and father giving evidence in court at the RCJ and the other parties joining remotely. But the mother's leading counsel is shielding and so is unable to attend in person. And the argument I think in the Court of Appeal is that that is, um, has Article 6 implications even though the junior barrister will be there in present in court when the mother gives evidence. I um, mean, that's an example of a decision that the judges are having to make at the moment and balance the different considerations. Obviously not um, addressing that particular case. Do you have any views about those sort of considerations? Well, I had in my um, three week trial, one of the reasons I went ahead, which uh, it, it, I suspect will come up in a lot of cases, is that the mother uh, had asthma and said she wasn't prepared to come to the RCJ. So what I'd originally proposed was that we did the medical evidence remotely and then we had we did what Mr Justice Williams was doing. But the mother said she wasn't prepared to come. And I, 
I think it will be very difficult to order people to come to court if they say they fall into a vulnerable category. I, I was reading a series of cases in the Chancery Division the other day about committals where, I mean, they have ordered people to come to court and they have proceeded to hear cases in their absence, um, even when it's a committal. But you have to be pretty confident that the person is not telling you the truth if that if, if you're going to force somebody who says they're vulnerable um, if they got COVID uh, to come to call. I, I think my view probably is that there will be very few cases in which you can't actually find a way of doing the case that everyone is prepared to live with. Um, it, it will happen occasionally, and I dare say that Court of Appeal case is an example of it. But for the most part, and certainly this was our experience in, in the Manchester case, that you, you, do, you, you may do different witnesses rather differently. Uh, the technology may sometimes not allow you to do it the way they'd like you to do it. But I, I think you, you can be flexible. And um, the great joy of the family division is you don't have to sit in a courtroom. You, it's perfectly lawful to do it anywhere. Um, so where people are uh, probably doesn't, doesn't matter too much. Um, I, I mean, I'm not quite sure why uh, people want to be in a courtroom, but I can see that that, that might occur. But... Um, I don't think there will be too many cases where some means that everyone can live with won't be found. I mean, one of the other issues, as um, everyone's been feeling their way through managing these hearings, is that uh, it's difficult to assess the credibility of a witness in a fact-finding hearing via this sort of platform, and that you need to have the physical presence in the court, actually being able to see that person and judge firsthand their reactions. Do either of you have any views about that? I think I've always been quite a, a, a believer in the seeing and hearing stuff uh, side of things, uh, only because having been a judge since 1992, you kind of get used to one way of doing things. Um, I think I'm, I, I didn't feel it's a disadvantage. Uh, I, I think it is a very slight disadvantage um, sometimes not being able to see how parties react to evidence is particularly how they're reacting when they're not giving evidence actually that is that is usually uh, important uh, and you can't see that this way it because it was the third trial it really probably didn't matter because they'd heard it all before anyway um, so there, there will be a slight disadvantage and as I think I probably said in my judgment, at the end of the day, you have to balance that forensic disadvantage against the cataclysmic consequences of adjourning something indefinitely. Mm. Um, and uh, uh, it doesn't, you know, you can't have everything in this world. Everything at the end of the day is a balance. And um, the, the balance, I think, will usually fall against adjourning cases in family matters. Naturally. So I, I come from a background at the bar where I never called a witness the fact. Um, I still find the idea that people lie to me really, really bizarre. I can't get my head around it at all. And so I, I think of the school that really the only way I can tell whether somebody's lying is by trying to compare what they're saying to other evidence that, you know, third party evidence, tape recordings, looking for inconsistencies, that kind of external benchmarking. And I, it may be my own failings as a judge, but I, I just can't really generally cannot tell from somebody's demeanor, whether they're sitting in court or in a remote hearing, whether they're lying to me. I've had people who are absolutely obviously lying because it's completely inconsistent with documents that I've got with a totally straight face and looking utterly compellingly truthful. I would have had no compunction in finding that they were telling the total truth if it wasn't blindingly obvious it wasn't true from something else. So I don't, uh, and I also am not, at, I, I'm not at all convinced that the demeanour of third parties, other parties in the well of the court, tells you very much. I mean, some people are great actors, some people are really into histrionics. How do I tell? I don't know. 
So for me, that remote aspect actually didn't trouble me too much. But then, having said all of that, I agree with Mark. Actually, oddly, when you are doing it remotely and you have the witness 12 inches in front of you on a screen, I think you can probably tell their reactions as well as you can in court. And I, I did wonder, uh, and of course, what you don't get if you're all sitting at home remotely is you don't get the majesty of the court. You don't mm. get the judge on the dais and the royal coat of arms. But I slightly wonder whether in most of the cases we do, that really makes any difference whatsoever. I've got a feeling that the people who lie to me on Zoom are going to lie to me in court and vice versa. So um, I, and interestingly, in my three week trial, I had one of the QCs who was a really tough, aggressive cross-examiner. And I think he was worried that he'd kind of lose his oomph because he was doing it remotely. And actually, I don't think it made, but again, didn't make very much difference because one of the things about being an advocate is that you have eye contact with the judge or you have eye contact with the witness. And actually, it was quite obvious in the cross-examination that, I won't name names, but this QC and the witness in question were very much having the same kind of relationship remotely as they would have done if they'd been staring across a courtroom. So that really surprised me, but that was my perception. And there's a couple of things um, that, that they tend in opposite directions, actually, but one of them is that uh, fact-finding is not an exclusively rational process. Uh, there, there's a bit more involved in assessing human beings than pure rationality. Um, and you have to be alert to that. And I didn't find that doing it remotely interfered with that. I, I think that, that that was all right. Uh, the other thing is, I too, even uh, uh, after the years I've been at it, I always start off assuming the witness is going to tell me the truth. And it's only if I'm gravely shocked into an opposite view that I'll take it. Um, but you have to remember, which is where the uh, not all rationality comes in, you have to remember that quite a lot of witnesses who are telling you something that is plain untrue actually themselves believe it now to be true. Mm. Uh, you can listen to two parties describe a marriage, both of whom you are satisfied are honest people, and you wonder if they're describing the same family. Um, it, it just, the, the perceptions can become so hardened and ingrained that actually at the end of the day, as um, uh, as Natalie was saying, you you are actually reliant on the other evidence uh, rather than trying to make a direct assessment of the person in front of you who may be honest and hopelessly wrong. Mm. I mean, a, a different aspect of. Oh, sorry, sorry, Natalie. On that, no, there was one thing I was thinking about this afternoon when I was thinking about this about doing this, and I, I, I there's lots of things that aren't there about COVID which will come out in the next kind of five years in research and you, you just you don't know at this stage but one thing that's crossed my mind is whether actually doing a remote hearing is less likely to give rise to some of the subconscious biases that exist within any legal system or any judicial system that one is less likely to be biased by a witness's cultural demeanor some of their you focus more i think on the absolutes in the evidence before you than on some of the more peripheral matters and it will be inter I, i'm not saying it is true it just seems to me something that it'll be worth somebody doing a research project on mm. um, in a few years time as to whether this is actually gives rise to a more objective kind of hearing mm. Mm. I mean, it's certainly, I mean, rather like, like, like our discussion now, I mean, it, it's in sharp focus. There, there is no slack time at all. <laughs> it's the same with a hearing. You know, there is, unless, as long as the technology works, you know, there, there isn't any, there's very few pauses, I've found. What yeah. about, what about um, keeping control of the courtroom and um, managing difficult litigants and difficult situations? Does it, make any difference as to whether you're hearing the case remotely or have people in front of you in court? I mean I haven't really had that even though I've had this an awful lot of hearings I haven't um, I've only had one person who's really been difficult who is a um, very well-known um, participant in family cases <laughs> 
as a lay person. Um, and he's an absolute nightmare in court. And he's marginally easier as a nightmare remotely because you can just turn his mic off, um, which is desperate measures, but at least it, it keeps him under control. So I've not, I've not, I think that it must be a, very difficult at the district judge level. But. Mm. I, I've always worked on the assumption that everybody will behave properly in court, and I'm surprisingly rarely disappointed. Um, I mean, generally speaking, <laughs> Uh, considering the matters we're dealing with, people behave, as, I think, astonishingly well in court. Um, that said, I, I can see how um, a difficult person who was consciously difficult rather than unconsciously difficult because they had mental health issues or whatever, but someone who was consciously difficult could, I think, come close to sabotaging a Zoom hearing if they wanted to, and it would require uh, very skillful management. I, I've not been confronted with that, so so I, I don't know. Um, certainly, I've found that uh, counsel who want to complain about each other do it in a much more moderate way in Zoom, uh, rather than leaping up and down. There, I didn't have any of that, although I did have, you know, some objections of the sort you would expect to have, but they were uh, communicated in a in a way which was perfectly easy to deal with and almost invariably resulted in the person asking questions at the time acknowledging the point and and changing tack um, so to that extent it was easier but I haven't confronted what I call serious difficulties um, but I I was deeply aware while doing this as I said at the beginning of my reliance on the goodwill and cooperation of everybody involved. Mm. I think there's a small element, I've only really just thought about this, by which people actually potentially behave a bit better remotely, partly because they haven't got the aggravation of sitting in the courtroom with somebody they loathe and detest. Partly, I think, that it was certainly always said when they, when um, the Supreme Court opened and everything was recorded. It was always said that barristers behave better. And you certainly are conscious of being on camera. And I think that I found myself the other day being conscious of the fact that I was being recorded on Zoom. And if I really lost it with this barrister who was driving me bonkers, you know, the Court of Appeal wouldn't just read a rather, rather cold transcript. They'd see Mrs. Justice Leaven pulling her hair out and going, no, stop. And I kind of restrained myself. <laughs> and um, I just wonder whether that influences, perhaps again, a bit subconsciously, quite a lot of people's behavior. I think also the fact that you cannot have two people talking at the same time. And so often in court, you'll have everyone jumping up. Whereas on this sort of format, it just doesn't work, you know, so somebody has to stop talking to let the other person speak, which is always quite helpful. What about um, looking beyond um, COVID-19, as um, we all want to do? Uh, what do you see as the sort of practices that may be uh, useful that have been developed during this period that we may want to, to continue with and use? Well, it'll affect me less because uh, I tend to sit only, only when people come and say, please do something. Um, so it's, for the most part, I only do set piece trials. So that, whereas I suspect a lot of, um, a huge amount has been learned about doing interlocutory and, and urgent and directions hearings. Mm -hmm. um, I've got a directions hearing in the Court of uh, Protection coming up. Uh, which I've agreed to do the directions by telephone, but have made it clear that I will not do any other hearing in the case by telephone because I regard the issues at stake as far too serious. Uh, and I think we should all be able to see each other however we do it. Uh, so probably by, by Zoom. Um, but my guess is that um, 
there is going to be more more remote working for the various advantages that both of you have pointed out in terms of uh, particularly where you've got a, a list of cases and people are not going to have to wait and all that sort of thing. But I think probably uh, Lucy and Natalie are going to know much better than I what the long-term implications of this really are going to be. Natalie, what do you see? <coughs> Could be. It has the potential to be incredibly positive. Um, so the uh, video hearings are far easier than phone hearings. Phone hearings mm. really don't work very well. People talk on top of each other. You can't see who's speaking. You often don't can't tell who's speaking unless you're very good at picking up the the, the voice. Um, so, I mean, I'm next time I'm the out of hours judge. I'm just going to say, well, let's do it on Zoom. Let's not do it by phone. So I think that's a real positive. I think in terms of interlocutory hearings, I mean, the technology, it's what I touched on earlier, you know, this technology is so much better than the video technology in court, where you, you're lucky if you've got four barristers, you might manage to see two faces and two heads back of usually, and then um, the lay clients disappear into the background of the courtroom and you can't hear properly, it's a nightmare. So, all that kind of remote stuff that we were doing before a little bit could be much expanded. It could also be hugely more efficient because, you know, it, it, certainly the way we work in the RCJ on an applications day is you can have 30 barristers and who knows how many clients sitting around outside court for hours on end. You don't need to do any of that. It can all be done from chambers remotely, um, not for any public health reason, but just because it's much more efficient. Um, and forces. I mean, there be, I mean, it may be said that the, the court, not having the court door, not having the discussions that take place outside that narrow the issues, how, how would you compensate for that? Don't get me on this one, Lucy. This, this drives me mad. As far as I'm concerned, if the court says 10.30, you are ready to go into court at 10.30. If you want to discuss the case with your opponent in advance in order to narrow the issues, you do that before 10.30. And I think half the family bar would be struck off if they started practicing in the Chancery Division because, I mean, you can, people just don't get their cases ready for 10.30. So, if, and what I found is when they have a remote time, they're much more efficient about it. They actually feel that they have to discuss it with their opponent the night before and sort things out. And if you're used to, I think the, the rationale that, as I understand it, the family bar uses, is well, I haven't seen my client until he or she pitches up at 9.45, so that's the first time I can discuss it. But we now all know that it is actually possible to have a discussion with your client remotely in advance. So there's obviously a place, particularly on kind of multi-handers and perhaps particularly court of protection multi-handers where the barristers actually all need to sit around a table that morning. And the, that, that's fine, but I think the rigor of of sorting stuff out in advance, remotely, not using the excuse of I'd have to get to the court door. Certainly that made me happy. Um, yes, I think having been a practicing uh, barrister in family and, and a circuit judge, I've long since been convinced of the duty of the judge to read the newspaper patiently. <laughs> um, but, well, well, because I, I appreciate, particularly if you have clients who are late or find it difficult to make decisions and find it difficult, you know, it's the door of the court. That, and criminal lawyers will know this terribly well, that it's the door of the court that finally means you can't prevaricate any longer. Uh, I think I'm, I haven't lost my patience over, over that, though I can, I have nothing but sympathy for people who come from other disciplines and it drives them bonkers. Um, but you're quite right. Uh, actually, um, th this kind of arrangement does require people to talk in advance to clients and does require uh, discussions between counsel in advance. I think with a set trial, that's much easier to um, expect than uh, these sort of, you know, if you've got a hearing over contact or something like that, it is quite difficult sometimes uh, to get clients to nail their colours to the mast until they're about to have to walk in through the door of the court. 
So I think it, 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 there's, a, there's a balance there, really. Just um, one more question. Somebody's asked about the practical matters, and I'm just going to open it up to other jurisdictions. Um, how did you feel um, in terms of any witnesses that you heard gave evidence, that you were satisfied that they were giving evidence on their own without any interference from anybody? Um, you know, did you need to take steps about that? In my case, every witness was required to state on oath at the beginning of their evidence that there was or wasn't anyone else in the room with them and, um, and that kind of thing. Um, otherwise, I, I, I agree, it, it's quite difficult. You, could, you wouldn't actually know if there was someone sitting in the corner coaching a witness. Uh, only for the most part, it's quite difficult to conceal that over a period of time. Uh, you can see someone's eyes wander and that sort of thing. Um, but I, I wasn't aware of it as a problem, I have to say. But it didn't occur to me, oh gosh, I wonder what's going on here. But then, you know, it was the family on the one hand and experts on the other, in my Nothing. case. Yes, I, I, I didn't make them swear on oath. Uh, nobody suggested it and it didn't cross my mind. I, I think on the cases I've done, a, I don't think any of the witnesses of fact I've seen would really have been assisted by somebody else in the room. They weren't those kind of cases. Mm. But I also think that actually it would, I mean, of course one might overstate one's own abilities, but I think it would be fairly obvious if there was somebody else in the room, unless they were doing it very subtly. I, I suspect it's more of an issue in a commercial trial where there may be real factual knowledge and what I think would be incredibly difficult would be to stop somebody. I mean, I've got my smartphone on the desk. I can put my eyes down. You don't know I'm reading my emails. I, I think that may it be more of an issue than in, in kind of primary fact finding about who abused the child. Um, mm. I, what I was, I, I, the thing I was the most concerned about was that, um, in various hearings that people weren't recording it um, because it wouldn't be at all difficult to work out. You only need to put your smartphone at the right place in the room and you could record the whole thing and put it on the internet. And I did every morning give everybody a little speech about how this must not be recorded, nothing must be said mm -hmm. externally. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, one, I think it's like a lot of things with remote trials, you can pick up problems but you, it's easy to forget that you get similar problems with real face-to-face -face trials. So I've been very concerned in one trial I did in the RCJ about a witness being in Perda overnight and in circumstances where I was reasonably confident she was going to go and collude with another witness overnight. And I started talking about sending her off to a hotel and the QCs, and, which is what you sometimes do in planning inquiries, bizarre. Um, and the... Um, QC said, don't be so ridiculous, nobody does that. If they're going to collude, they're going to collude. <laughs> and yeah. I think they probably colluded. <laughs> I don't think remoteness would have made much difference. Mm. The initiative in my case actually came from council to, to ask those questions. And indeed, as you've reminded me, they also asked for a statement on oath that there was no other recording going on. Mm. But the I think what we, we, we will get the highly disgruntled litigants who will be able to put, I, I would be astonished if we come out of all this without one of our highly disgruntled litigants having put inappropriate recordings on, onto the internet. Mm. And then just connected with that is, is management of bundles and papers and things. Did, how, how did you manage that? Because did you have an electronic bundle? How were the witnesses shown documents, etc.? In, in the long case in Manchester, we had case lines, so everything was brilliantly set up electronically and even I could understand it. Mm. Um, we had just the ordinary electronic bundles. <clears throat> I forgot what the system's called now in this case. Um, but in fact, I was provided with a paper set. Um, but like so many of these bundles, you're given 25 lever arch files. And if you look at 10 pages, it's a, it's a surprise. I mean, not quite, but, 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 but very nearly. Um, so 
papers didn't didn't really present a problem in our case um, because and in, sorry and in yours Natalie what did you, did you have electronic bundles we we had nothing but the electronic bundle I didn't have a single piece of paper mm -hmm. and actually from my personal point of view that was the worst aspect of the whole thing I did after a week discover how to um, annotate an electronic bundle. I never discovered how to do the equivalent of the yellow tabs. The yellow post-it notes and pink highlighter pens are a fundamental part of my existence. And I, I got round it. I, I'm very good at workarounds. So I got round it by noting down very carefully every page reference that I wanted to use in the judgment. And then I- What about for the witness? What about for the witness? So for the witnesses, um, the mother, was, was good on the computer and had the electronic bundle and had it, and, and that worked fine. The father um, didn't want to use the electronic bundle. And when he was cross-examined, all references were read to him. But I think that references would have been read to him anyway. Right. And most of the references were texts and WhatsApps. So it wasn't problematic. I... I think a huge difficulty would be a uh, litigant who had learning difficulties. Yeah. I think that would be really hard to judge whether they were following. Yeah, but you have the, you again have the same problem in court there, don't you? I mean, I personally strongly discourage counsel in Children Act proceedings cross-examining extensively from documents. I think it just puts clients, most clients, at a serious disadvantage and it's operating the system in a way that's convenient to the lawyers and inconvenient to the clients. And yeah. actually, it, it reduces the effectiveness of cross-examination very substantially if you have even a hint of a feeling that the client is not coping with the structure of, of, of the, the way the case is being done. So I try to keep them, keep their heads out of bundles at all times. Um, these were all, Mark, these were pretty much all either WhatsApp messages yeah. between the parties That's different. or surveillance material. Yeah. Yeah. There was a lot of surveillance material. Um, so it wasn't documents as it, as it were generated, you know, init yeah. initially generated documents. If people want to get me going, they get a witness to look at another witness's statement. Uh, that, 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 uh, yes, no, no. send me. All right, casting, casting our eyes a little, a little wider, um, obviously a number of attendees at this uh, webinar are not family practitioners and um, just want to just ask you both about how you think the way the family courts are operating and have started to operate um, could be used in other jurisdictions, crime, civil? Well, I suppose I did a reasonable amount of crime, both as a practitioner and a judge. I mean, the problem in crime is the jury, isn't it? If, 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 you take, if you take any aspect of crime that doesn't involve the jury, uh, then I see absolutely no reason why you, you can't do it. And indeed, that's exactly what they are doing now. Um, the jury will be more difficult, if only because you've got to have uh, 11 extra locations added in. Uh, and um, you're distancing jurors from each other. Um, so I, if you do it, if you do it purely by Zoom, um, so I'm not, I'm not sure about that, but it seems to be non-jury trials in civil, uh, for the most part, uh, should present no more difficulties to doing it this way. Um, particularly if, uh, factual disputes are, are less common. Um, now, of course, in the kind of common law stuff I did, they were mostly about factual disputes, but in the rather more rarefied world that others live in, uh, very often they aren't factual disputes, there are disputes about all sorts of other things. Natalie, what do you think? Well, I, I think at this stage it splits into two really very different issues. Uh, technically, I think you could do most of the work I used to do remotely. You can do... You can appear in the Court of Appeal remotely. You can do a, all weeks on end in the admin court. I, I think it works technically fine. I, um, but it 
I think seriously undermines the concept of open justice. And we're a long way from a society where the idea that, you know, people can log into cases in the way that they can walk into the RCJ. Obviously, it works in the Supreme Court where people log in very regularly, but that's a very different kind of feel. I think open justice still requires cases to be heard in a court where the public can literally just walk in. I also think that there's a real issue about how we all work. I mean, without going off on, on a real tangent, you know, human beings are sociable animals who need other human beings to have contact with them. And I actually think what I've found most difficult over the last 10 weeks is not being able to walk into Mr. Justice Hayden's room or Mr. Just, Mrs. Justice Knowles's room four times a day and go, what do you think about this? Do you think we should do that? How about this? And of course I can ring them up if there's a crisis, but you know, I can't ring them up more than twice a week or they'll think I'm a bull. Um, and that kind of interaction, whether it be for barristers in chambers or judges in, in the RCJ, I think is incredibly important to one's well-being, to the quality of the job you do, um, and to career development, for particularly for barristers. So, you know, remote hearings can work, but there's a whole other story out there that needs to be thought about. All right, well... My clock says 5.59. Um, I think we're meant to conclude at, at six. Um, if we were all together in Gray's Inn Hall, um, I would ask the audience to express their appreciation for the fascinating discussion I think that we've had uh, utilising the experience of both Mark and Natalie to be able to tease out the issues that we've all had to deal with and are dealing with on a on a day-to-day -day basis. I hope the attendees have found it interesting and useful and um, I'd also just like to thank Tony, Charles and Sam Hutchinson for uh, organising this and supporting us in a discussion that we had earlier this morning about the format. So I hope it's been useful for everybody who's attended. And I think I can't even do an, an electronic applause for everybody I'm afraid. <laughs> We'll wave. We'll wave. <laughs> so thank you very much to all of everyone who joined and I hope you found it useful. All right then. Bye bye.